Hey guys, we're Tan here, back again. Today is Sunday, 17th November 2019, and we're Sunday, but we are filming. So yeah, this is what we're gonna show you. Uh, can you please get this golden? Uh, this. Wait a minute. This is the Zenith Extreme. This is from 2017. So why are you passing me this? Oh, I thought it was a comparison video. Oh, uh, when you compare, you need to do something to compare with, right? Okay, so uh, we have one year. And of course now we got the beast. Oh my! The ROG Zenith 2 Extreme. This is one heavy. Of course, thank you so much to Asus Singapore for lending us this bad boy, this beast, this monster to play with. We have rules. We cannot show you numbers. We can only show you what's inside and what's the features of this new board. And Babu will live in a one week time. This is a beast of a board. Uh, of course, yes, you guys yes. want to know what's inside. This is one unboxing we clearly want to show you guys. So, Gordon, please take it away. Yes, I will. Before we carry on this video, if you want to watch more of such PC tech hardware reviews, make sure to subscribe to my channel and click on the bell to know when I put new videos. And watch to the end because this is going to be an amazing, powerful ass unboxing review. So back to where we all begin, we're going to run through the features of this new Zenith 2 Extreme. Please take it away. Okay, so before we can talk about features, of course, this has to come out from this box. This is one very heavy box. There must be quite a couple of things inside there, so when you open the lid, Yeah, that looks glorious. Welcome to the Republic, yeah. The one lovely thing when you get a ROG board is that, yeah, it's always a very special occasion when you get it out of its box. And this guy is no exception. So the first thing you will see is the motherboard itself. Right now it's being covered with a piece of plastic. So let me get this one out first. I'll just put it back over here. Okay, right, so the first thing we do after we get the plastic out is we have the motherboard itself. So it's a very nice looking board. First thing that strikes you is just how hefty this board is. Yeah, just carrying it like that. Yeah, this guy feels a lot heavier than some entire motherboard boxes. So I'll move this right along here. Be careful with it. Yes, 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 I know. Very, very careful with it. Right, so when you come to here, so we have the other things that come with it. First off, let's open the flaps one by one. I'll open this one. Ah, and you have a lot of things inside here. So first off, we have this thing over here. The fan hub fan controller, followed by the requisite cables that come with it. So you have these guys right over here. The cables, temperature sensor cables, um... A whole lot of cables actually, very much a lot. So you have the RGB cables, uh, the USB. This is very useful because it's gone are the days where you have where you have a CD or a DVD inside here. I guess uh, ASUS finally figured out that yeah, now what most PCs don't have an uh, optical drive anymore. So they come with a USB drive with all your utilities and drivers inside there. So good job, ASUS. Gordon, do you want to lay out all the components so we can take a look? Uh, get some space, man. Yeah, get it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this box is huge. Let's try and find some room to lay everything out. That's a USB cable. These look like RGB cables. I'm not sure what this does. <laughs> yeah, the, these look like thermistor cables. Cables for the fan hub itself. Ah, uh, yes. SATA cables. More SATA cables. ROG Wedge. 3 pin RGB cables together with the other RGB cables. SATA cables right over here. ROG badge. This is the pin out for the front panel headers. Another good positive step by ASUS because this allows you to just plug all your front panel connectors to here and you just one shot plug into the motherboard itself. Another small but very kind gesture from ASUS. And of course, we have M.2 screws. M.2 screws. Some other small screws. Even more M.2 screws. When you pay like this kind of price, you just get a lot of screws. Yeah, you get pretty screwed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's this? Oh, this is cute. This is a magic. Yes, this is very interesting. I've never seen this before. Oh my god. Hold oh, on, what the hell is that? This is a screwdriver for the M.2. They actually put this thing in. Okay, to tell you why I'm so amazed by this, a lot of people have the usual standard size screwdrivers, but a lot of them don't quite have 
the smaller size Phillips screw head to mount the M.2. So this is a very good step by us. So at least you don't have to go hunting for a screwdriver. Why they have to provide this, we'll go in a little bit of later details. There's more than one head here, which is absolutely needed. So why? And we have these items. There's more M.2 screws. Okay, yes, the M.2 screws are probably for this. This is the dim riser, which is for you to put two M.2 SSDs. So in this case, it'll be two pieces of PCIe 4.0 SSDs. If you were to just look right over here, you see this little slot here? Okay, let me get this out of the back kitchen first. This is the M.2 riser. So this goes to here. If you look a little bit closer, you can see the connectors here. The place where the M.2 actually goes in. So, so there's one on each side. So in the total, you have two on this riser itself. So let me just put this back in. This has been quite exciting so far. Yes, for an ROG board, this has a lot of things that it comes with. Now we get to this part. So if I were to open here, we get this out. If you open here, more cables. This guy comes with a lot of SATA cables. I count one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. Eight SATA cables. Yeah, that's a lot of SATA cables, even for a track ripper board. So we have the Wi Fi Bluetooth antenna for the set itself. So we bring it out to here. And finally, yes, last but not least, we have one of the most important items stickers! <laughs> stickers! Even more stickers! Nah, just kidding. 20% off for cable mod cables. Then we have the little manual for the fan extension card. Yes, we have the awesome. ROG Coaster, yes. In all seriousness, this is the most important part of the whole thing. Because if you're gonna buy a motherboard like this, you obviously will want to know from start to end what are all the different features, how to connect everything up. The one thing I always tell people, if you're not sure how to hook, that's what this guy is for. Gordon has spent a whole night last night studying this manual. So yes, a lot of, I drank a lot of coffee. Right, so now we come to motherboard itself. You guys are really wanting to know what makes this sport special, what sets it apart from a lot of other TRX 40s. The one thing that strikes me first and foremost is the hefty heatsink down here for the VRM modules right over here. It's got active cooling so if you look inside you can see two small little fans right in the grill down here. So there's active cooling for the VRMs right over here so this is a good thing especially since if you consider that the TRX40 is supposed to handle the almost rumor, almost confirmed 64 core track ripper. So moving right along to this side as I mentioned this is the dim slot. This is where the card that slots into M.2's this clicks them right over here. We move right along here. The other thing that catches my attention is most motherboards you see today have at the best probably one USB 3.2 Gen 2 connector. This board has two. So one here, one here. So two of them side by side. So even though cases today with more than one USB Type-C connector to the front are pretty rare, but at least ASUS has acknowledged that USB 3.2 Gen 2 is coming more and more common on future case design. So it's good that ASUS included in the second connector. We move right along down here. You see the 24 pin, the two thumbs eight pin is over here for the CPU power in. I would say it's pretty much at this point in time with the 64 core on the horizon with the projector power requirements. Yes, you definitely need two thumbs eight. This one over here, the manual didn't clearly explain what this guy does but what I'm guessing is that this does pretty much the same function as uh, 4 pin Molex over here. There's a 4 pin Molex down here right below all the PCIe slots. They supply additional power to the PCIe rails in case you have multiple other PCIe expansion cards. The 8 SATA ports are here, the USB 3.0 is here, we have another one here so for a total of 2 you could probably put it on the case with 4 thumbs USB 3 in front. There are a couple of switches unique to this board right over here. So some of it is keen to those people who are playing with LN2 overclocking records that kind of thing so there are certain switches which we're probably not going to go into detail. The usual RGB 12 volts and 5 bins connectors. What makes this guy a little bit special and a little bit oddball? There are two M.2 slots right over here. One here, one here. And there's a third one which is right under here. <laughs> Opinions can probably be a bit divided as to whether this is a good place to put an M.2 SSD but the one problem designing a track ripper board is that of space. But when you got a CPU socket that's so big already and you want to cram so much features onto a standard ATX board, you're inevitably going to have compromises like this. If we were to come to the behind, you have a lot of USB 3.2 slots, 9 of them here, standard USB, 
USB Type-C right over here. You have your audio connected out here with an optical out. This is the Wi-Fi, it's a wireless AX. And of course, you have a BIOS switch. This is to clear the CMOS. And yes, you have two LAN ports down here. So what's the difference between the two of them? This one is the standard 1 gigabit Ethernet. This is the Aquantia 10 gigabit port itself. 1 gig. 10 gig. The one thing good about this port is that peripherals using 10 gig lag getting more and more common. This is going to become more of a thing in the next couple of years and you can see them start popping up on board. The one thing I've always liked about both the original Zenith as well as this upgraded one is that the status display is here. So what makes this place here so special? Now a lot of the other Threadripper board tend to put the diagnostic display somewhere here. You just imagine you have a lot of big giant PCI expansion cards here, 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 here. The diagnostic display here, it's gonna get blocked. So put it here, so no matter if you pack this place with three gigantic uh, GPUs, they'll be able to see what's going on using this display right over here. Without further ado, I will bring the elder sibling, the original Zenith Extreme, up onto the table. Good that we have these two boards here so we can do a side-by-side -side comparison. First off, you're gonna notice the original board has the socket very close to the very first PCIe Thumb 16 slot. This can sometimes pose issues, especially if you have a very large air cooler like the Noctua D14 or the D15. It's gonna block off this first slot, which means you can't put your GPU here. One of the design improvements is that the socket has been moved further away. There won't be any of those clearance issues with big air coolers. The old board has one USB Type-C front connector, the new one has two. So one, two. The other thing they have also changed is that on the old board, if you wanted to power the PCIe rail, you only have one option, the 4-pin Molex. On the new board, they have added two options. One is the Molex and the PCIe power in. Having this option saves you the effort of having to stick one Molex power cable to your power supply just for this guy all right over here. The VRM heat sinks here are much, much, much bigger. There are some changes, however, that I'm a little bit on the fence. Something's got removed. One notable thing that got removed is the U.2 connector for Enterprise SSDs. The new model doesn't have it anymore. The Azus probably figured that in this category of HDT users, not many of them are going to be using Enterprise SSDs that use U.2. Probably the decision was made to cut out the U.2 connector to save extra PCB space for other things. But the biggest change that I can see is the PCIe slot arrangement. On the original Zenith Extreme, the four PCIe 3.0x16 slots are evenly spaced. 60 slot, blank, slot, blank, slot, blank, slot. This allows you to very easily do GPGPU config, general purpose computing using GPUs where you have four times maybe say RTX 2080 TIs for those people into deep learning and machine learning or any other GPU render or compute task. This guy however, Azus made the decision to move everything here a bit more down. Can pack a hefty VRM heat sinks as well as more of the VRM circuitry right over here. You now have one blank file, one, but there's no blank file between these two. Then you have a blank file here. So you only can pack at the most three GPUs in a normal config. One here, one here, one here. In the box, three, 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 three. Yeah, you could probably put a fourth one, but you probably have to get a case to a vertical riser. You probably have like a GPU, 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 and then you have a cable coming out from here with another GPU down here. It's gonna look very odd, but I see that as the only way you're gonna get four GPUs installed on this motherboard. It was probably a very hard design decision that they had to do because if they did not do this, they would have been quite severely limited on this portion as well. So this is one thing that you have to consider, especially if you you are buying Threadripper for GPU compute task. Other than that, I find that it's quite a fair bit of improvement over the things. That's the comparison between the two bots itself. Wow, that was a very hefty first walkthrough of this new Zenith 2 Extreme. So Gordon, having a look at this board for the first time, what are your thoughts so far? And number two, there's a major dying question for all of you AMD users out there. Can you explain to us this major thing about this network compatibility issue between this old board and the new board for the AMD Ryzen Threadripper CPUs? Okay, to answer the first point, the Zenith Extreme when it came out in 2017, it really epitomizes the name that it was given. It was very simple. If you had the budget and if you wanted the best X399 motherboard, you got this board. When you have a board named the Zenith, the successor must have very high standards that it must not only reach, it must exceed as well. Surpass the Zenith. It has to surpass the Zenith, yeah. yeah. And do I think that it has gone past and become better? 
Yes, I believe it does. It's not a perfect design. There are a lot of things here that are improved from this. Everybody know there'll be a 64 core that will eventually sit here. Yeah. You need a powerful board for a CPU or that level, so do I believe the new Zenith Extreme is capable of handling it from the first look of it? I think definitely yes. Yes. Now coming on to the second question, a lot of people have been commenting online as to why 3rd gen has broken backward compatibility with the 1st and the 2nd gen track ripper. AIE, a 3rd gen CPU cannot be used in the older X399 ports. And likewise, 1st and 2nd gen CPU cannot be plugged here. So, they don't talk to each other man, they're not friends with each other. <laughs> I won't say that. <laughs> so that there is a clean break between two of them. Yeah, <laughs> emphasis on break. When they first came out in 2017, along with the Threadripper first gen CPUs, I think most people will probably agree with me. It was pretty much everybody trying to find their way. It was the very first time that AMD had released a high end desktop platform. I think Azus did a very good job given those kind of circumstances with the original Zenith Extreme. When this board came out with the active cooling here, a lot of people back then thought, this board is major overkill. Yeah. Kill everybody was like, this is ridiculous. Too much, man. This yeah. is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. I ain't gonna pay this kind of money. One year later, the 32 core 2990 WX dropped. And suddenly, the overkill became a requirement. You must have these things to properly run the 2990 WX. It was a positive thing that was not shared by a lot of the other first gen X399 motherboards. A lot of those first gen ports couldn't really use the 2990 WX to its full potential. So basically, as soon as the foresight of having this cooling solution to fully maximize the potential of the 2990 WX. With the jump being so far from first to second gen, the jump from second to third gen became even greater because the third gen starts at 24 core. The <laughs> middle guy is 32 core. Yeah. And there is the semi confirmed 64 core monster. <laughs> Getting the 64 core to run properly on the previous gen X399 boards would have been mission impossible. If you were to look at it from that point, the lessons that they learned designing this generation were put into place into this generation. So do I believe the clean break is a good thing? Yes, I believe they do. It allows both AMD as well as the various motherboard manufacturers to take the lessons that they learn to give you a nice and proper port that can fully maximize your Ryzen Trap Ripper per gen CPU. Yeah, we are waiting for the monster to drop. Make sure to check back on our channel to see whether we do get that monster so that we can test out and uh, maximize potential of this Zenith 2 Extreme. We hope to get our hands on the third gen Trap Ripper. Modern, uh, I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check back when Embargo leaves. You guys may see the potential and the numbers for this Zenith 2 Extreme, so check back out. Thank you, Gordon, again. We just finished filming this, so this video will be up very soon. In the meantime, you can check out my other videos right here, or you can check out my still doing very well the, the AMD uh, stock cooler versus aftermarket cooler video. Now we plan for this video to boom so so. Remember to click on the eye icon in the center, subscribe to my channel, and click on the bell to know when I put up new videos, especially for this guy. Thank you, Gordon, again. Thank you. Signing out. Ciao.